Okay, we're going to kind of put everything now together that we've been doing. And we want to solve a very simple problem. Okay, it's kind of an interesting question. I want to consider n by n matrix A, nothing about it. A can be singular, A can be non singular, nothing except that it is n by n. Okay? I want to find a vector x such that A times x, my n by n matrix times this vector, which obviously is n by 1, is equal to a scalar multiple of x. And we use lambda. Now, for those in Calc 3, this could be a little bit confusing. Where, where have we seen lambda before? Lagrange yeah, Lagrange multiplies. This is none, not in any conceivable capacity related. We just, we just chose to say we could have used a different letter, Greek letter, but we, we use lambda. We want to find x. Now, here's the absolute money back guarantee. Every n by n matrix that existed. It took some time, but I went through all of them last night just to make sure. Every n by n matrix that exists has at least one vector where this is true. That is not the zero vector. I'm looking for vectors, not the zero vector. Zero vector doesn't even come into. Obviously, if x was the zero vector, this would always be true, wouldn't it? Because I get the zero vector on both sides. No, we're looking for non-trivial vectors. You're absolutely guaranteed to have that happen. Isn't that crazy? So, how would I solve this? Well, hmm. If in baby algebra I did something like this, a times x equals, I don't know, b times x, we'd write a minus b times x equals 0. We'd probably do something like that. a and b aren't scalars. a and b are, could be functions. We'd do something like this. Agreed? So let's do something like this. If I wrote ax minus lambda x, what would that equal? The zero vector, yes. Not the number. It would be the vector. Because in both cases. So all i got to do is factor this, right? Oh, that's easy. Piece of cake. All right, life is good. It's just one tiny, almost too small to notice little element here. Um, a is a matrix, matrix and lambda. Scalar. Oh, so I can't really do that, can I? Oh, but if I could, it would be really cool. Do you agree? If I could. So, hmm. as my wife always likes to say, that no work. But what if, let me ask you something. Is that true? Yeah. I is n by n. Is, is this identically equal to this? Yes, it is. So what if I did this? Oh, now can I factor it? I want to solve this. I'm guaranteeing you there's at least one solution that does not involve the zero vector. Absolutely guaranteeing you there's at least one. Now, so wait a minute, that does not involve the zero vector. Hold on, hold the phone. Let's back up a little bit. When we did stuff like this, this has a unique solution if and only if. A is non-singular. Determinant of A is non-zero. It's row reducible to identity, blah, 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 blah. If and only if this only has a trivial solution, meaning the zero vector is the only solution. I'm asking you for that not to be the case. I want to solve this for non-trivial solutions. I said the zero vector can't be an answer. I want all non-trivial solutions. This is basically the same thing, isn't it? Something x equals the zero vector, and I want non-trivial solutions. Well, how could that be? That could only be true if, this, this is a matrix, by the way. It would only be true if that matrix is? Zero matrix? Zero matrix? No. Singular? Singular. Oh, so if that matrix is singular, then I'm guaranteed non-trivial solutions. In fact, exactly how many? Infinitely many. Infinitely many. I, I was thinking the three right off the top of my head, but yeah, infinitely many. And none of those are the zero vector, by the way. So here's all I need. I just need the determinant of this to equal.
equal zero. Whoa, that's it. I just need the determinant of this statement to equal zero. When I discover whatever value, right, I need to discover whatever value of lambda. There is a, there's a lambda out there that makes this equal to zero. Heck, lambda could equal zero for all I know. But there is a value of lambda that will make that equal zero. When I find that value of lambda, then I can work backwards and figure out what the x is. Cool. Now, every matrix, every square matrix has at least one. X is called an eigenvector. Lambda is called its associated eigenvalue. Every time there's an eigenvalue, there's an eigenvector associated with it automatically. Okay? So how does this process work? Hmm. How, do I, how do I figure this out? Well, let's start with something fairly small. Okay? Oops. Let's start with, how about, let's let A be the matrix 4, negative 5, 2, negative 3. We've never seen this problem before. Wink, wink, right? We've only looked at this the last two classes in a row, by the way. Now, where is this matrix coming from? I'm just making it up. No, it is the standard matrix of some linear transformation. Every matrix you'll ever work with from now on is the standard matrix of some linear transformation. I just want to start with the matrix. I want to do this problem right here. I'm going to take it from start to finish so you see the whole process. So the first thing I'm going to do is do the determinant of A minus lambda I. So when I do that, I want the determinant of 4 minus lambda, negative 5, 2, negative 3, minus lambda. How did I know to, be, to do that? Because what does lambda i look like? A diagonal matrix with lambda entry. It's a diagonal matrix with lambda on every diagonal entry. Oh, so essentially I'm asking you to do this. 4 minus 5, 2, negative 3, minus lambda 0, 0, lambda. So what are my new diagonal entries? They're numbers minus lambda. Oh, OK. This is always what you do. You're subtracting lambda from every diagonal entry. That's it. Okay. Now, let's evaluate this determinant. Let's set it equal to zero, and then we will solve. So when I multiply this out, I'm going to get negative 12 minus 4 lambda plus 3 lambda plus lambda squared plus 10, which is, oops, I lost it. Lambda squared. There we go. Lambda squared minus lambda, minus 2, and I'm setting that equal to 0. Huh. That factors. Now, big picture. I have a quadratic. I'm guaranteed two solutions. My solutions can both be real. I can have one repeated solution, or I can get two complex solutions. Agreed? In chapter 7, all of your solutions are going to be real. In chapter 8, all your solutions are, well, We'll, we'll look at chapter 8 later. For now, all your, all your lambdas are going to be real for now. And in fact, even better than real, they're all going to be integer values. Lambda does not have to be an integer. But in this chapter, they'll all be integers because the rest of the algebra is too horrific if they're not integers. So at the end of class yesterday, you said we would be looking at more complex uh, problems. Did you mean literally complex? Or complex uh, difficult problems? and complex. Okay. Difficult, now, complex later. <laughs> yeah, chapter 8 is, is matrices of complex numbers. So that's literally complex problems. So, equals 0 where? We'll say lambda 1 is 2 and lambda 2 is negative 1. I'm going to label them because I'm going to work with them one at a time. Now, let me go way back over to here. So what I need to do next is I need to solve this problem right here. So let's start with the first eigenvalue of negative 2. So I need to solve the problem a plus 2i, that's minus 2 times lambda i, times x equals, in this case, the two-dimensional zero vector. Lambda 1 is positive 2. Oh, oh, thank you, Rick. Too far away on this side. Thank you. So that should be minus. 
Okay, so what does this look like? This looks like, subtract two from your main diagonal. So that would be two negative five, two negative five. You're gonna multiply it by, if you will, x1, x2, and you're gonna get, this is the problem you are now asked to solve. Everybody see that? I mean, hopefully that's really obvious. I don't want you to rewrite this. I want you to go directly to this. Because you're going to do row operations. You're not going to find it using an inverse or anything else. You're just going to straight up do row operations. Well, why wouldn't I want to find it using an inverse? Because it's, it's singular. It's never going to be invertible. Oh, like as in ever. It's always singular, so you can't use an inverse. Row operations is the only way. Well, can I, can I try Cramer's rule? No, it's singular. Yeah, row operations is it. So here's the way I'm writing it. Here's the way I like to do it. We're doing a minus 2i augmented with zeros. That's, that's exactly what this says. That's my shorthand. Once I have my eigenvalues, this is the very next thing I'm going to do. Okay? Now, when I take negative row 1 and I add it to row 2, I'll move this way. When I take negative row 1 and I add it to row 2, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a row of zeros. Gee, that means I'm going to have to parameterize. I either have to parameterize or I don't. I'm either going to get a row of zeros or I won't. Not getting a row of zeros means the zero vector is the only solution. The zero vector can't be a solution. That means everything went wrong. If Rampton hadn't caught my negative sign error, we would have had not a row of zeros, but a non-zero row, and we would have found zero, zero is our wrong answer. We'd say, what did we do wrong? Well, exactly what I just did. I subtracted that because I couldn't read my own writing. So there are some built-in checks. You can't get the zero vector <laughs> because you're finding all the non-trivial solutions. So I need to parameterize this. Neither one of them is a 1, so do you remember how to go easily? Let x2 be 2t, oh, two two and then what's x1? 5t. By the way, you can do halves. Why? <laughs> it's easier to do this. So here's how we say it. Any vector in the form 5t comma 2t, which is t times 5 comma 2. Now, this part is huge. This is some of the biggest from a theoretical standpoint. An eigenvector is not one vector. An eigenvector is a basis vector of an entire vector space. Okay? What's the vector space called? It's called the eigenspace of lambda equals 2. You're going to find everything in your life is going to become eigen. You know, later on when you have your eigenburgers and you know you watch your eigen movie, everything's going to be eigen. You're, you're laughing. No, literally, every every word's going to start with eigen something. Five two, not t five two. Five two itself. That vector clearly is the basis of something. What is it exclusively the basis of? The null space of this matrix. That's what we just found. That's why null spaces are so important. We just found the null space of this very specific matrix, this one right here. And whenever you guys describe a null space, don't you always describe it as the span of the basis? It's just easier. So it's the basis itself that I want. So I'm going to say then, not let, but choose my first eigenvector to be 5, 2. Could I choose it to be something else? Sure. Any multiple of 5, 2 other than the zero vector would also work. But why choose a different one? Just pick that one. So that is our first eigenvector. It is the basis of the eigenspace of lambda equals 2. Every eigenvalue has an eigenspace, and every eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector. It is possible for an eigenvalue to actually have more than one eigenvector, but they all have at least one. We'll do an example where there's more than one later. Okay? So far, so good? Now, I'm pretty sure I, I've done everything right so far. Are you okay with pretty sure? No. There is a check, and the check is so easy and so absolutely necessary. You're going to multiply 
a times x. 20 minus 10 is 10. 10 minus 6 is 4. And this is exactly 2 times this. Do I have a times x equaling lambda times x? Yes, that is the check. It either checks or does not. Now here's the nice thing. If you just solve this, then you know you did it right. But can I still screw this up and make a sign error? I mean, when we're parameterizing, let's face it, when I asked you guys for the parameters, more than one of you threw out a negative number. That was, that was incorrect. So if I accidentally have make one of these negative, that's not going to work. That's why you got to do the check. And then when it doesn't work, you go, oh, I messed up the negative. Let me go back and fix it. Then you fix it, and now everything's perfect. Okay. So far, so good. We've just found our first eigenvalue, or excuse me, our first eigenvector because we found the eigenvalues first. Now let's find the second one. The second one was negative 1. So the way we'll write it, we're going to write a minus negative 1 times i, and we will augment that with 0. So that's what the state that's exactly what we just did, all of this. I don't need you to do this, 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 and then eventually get to here. <laughs> Let's just start from here, OK? So what is it we're saying? We're saying we're going to augment this with zeros. And what would that give us? I'm adding 1 along the main diagonal. So that would be negative 5, 5, 0, 2, negative 2, 0. How about we take negative a fifth of row 1? Now let's add negative 2 row 1s plus row 2, and hey, row of zeros. That's a good thing. In a square matrix, a row of zeros means I'm going to have to parameterize. Shouldn't it be 5, negative 5? What did I write? Oh, yeah. You're oh, right. oh, oh, oh. You're right. Thank you, Zachary. 5, OK. Okay, so that's right. <laughs> yeah. So that part's still good. Just you're multiplying by positive fifth. And it's positive two. Good catch. And did I screw that one up? I know, never mind. Two negative Don't two. Don't listen to me. Nope. So are we good? We'll know in a minute when it doesn't check, right? <laughs> I'd rather know now. I, I just really hate working with errors. All right. So at this point here, what's our parameterization? We're gonna let x1 equal t and then x2 is t. Doesn't matter which order I do it. So any vector of the form t comma t, which is t times 1, 1. Now, I've actually had people tell me, oh, the, the way you get your eigenvectors, you replace t with a value. No, you don't. You never do that. Because if that were legal, then you just made the 0 vector the answer to every question, because you would always choose 0. Well, you can replace it with any number but 0. No, you can't replace t with any number. That's incorrect. No, 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 no. You have a multiple of 1, 1, where t can be any real number. And by the way, the 0 multiple of this number still checks. But this is the basis of the eigenspace. You don't pick a value for t. You say it's t times what vector? That vector is the basis of my eigenspace. You never pick a value for t. There's no logic to that. Because again, that would allow you to choose 0 as an eigenvector every time. So that's going to be my eigenvector. So we are going to choose, OK? Could you have picked, let's just say you picked you know, x, one of these to be negative t, and then the other one ended up being negative t. And so you have multiples of negative 1, negative 1. And so your eigenvector is negative 1, negative 1. Would that, would that be legal? Yes. Because when you factored it, that's what you got. Absolutely correct. So now we're going to check that one. So if I did it right. Looks like 1, 1. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. And that, in fact, is negative 1 times 1, 1. Minor rejoicing. I already knew it was going to work. Now, we've worked with this problem the last few days, haven't we? We worked with the matrix where I gave you the vectors, and everything worked. You go, man, Mr. Brennan, how did you know those were going to be the vectors? Well, I grabbed eigenvectors from a problem, and then I worked backwards and said, let's do a non-standard matrix. Everything was wonderful. The problem is, I had to tell you what vectors to use. 
you want to be able to discover the vectors on your own for every single problem. Boy, okay, so far so good? Now, uh, I erased a couple things. At the beginning, when we were solving, when we were solving the a minus lambda i equals zero, we got a polynomial. And the degree of the polynomial was the same n by n matrix, let's just call that, you know, nth degree in that sense. I'm going to get a polynomial of lambda that's exactly the same degree, right? Because I'm going to have exactly that many terms of lambda that I'm multiplying out. If I have a bigger matrix, that can be a little trickier, can't it? Because I'm going to have to factor something of a larger degree. The equation that we got was lambda squared minus lambda minus 2 equals 0. This part alone, not the equal 0, this is called the characteristic, characteristic polynomial. This part right here. The characteristic polynomial is the polynomial you get when you take the determinant of a minus lambda i. When I set it equal to 0, what does it become? The characteristic equation. That was an equation. You will have heard both terms, and it might sound confusing. The characteristic equation is the characteristic polynomial set equal to zero. When you're given a polynomial in baby algebra, you're told to factor it. And you're done once you factor it. But then later, you're giving that polynomial equal zero, and you're told to solve. So what did you do? You factored it, and then you set each of your factors equal to zero. Oh, OK. So you took the same thing, and you just kept going. So the characteristic polynomial tells us a lot. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you something right off the bat that's eminently cool, and I'm only going to do it with a 2 by 2 because it takes too long to do it with a 3 by 2. All right. One of the most powerful linear algebra theorems that you're going to do in an upper division class is something called the Cayley-Hamilton-Hamilton theorem. I, I don't need you to know this. I'm going to tell you what it is and just show you. It's like a really cool demonstration. Every matrix... So it has to be square to begin with, because there, this problem only exists for a square matrix. Every matrix that you're doing this on, so the square matrix, satisfies its own characteristic equation. So what are you saying? If I replace lambda with the entire matrix, what? how does that work? Well, we have to tweak it a little bit. I can square a matrix. I can subtract the matrix, but I can't subtract the number 2, but what can I subtract? 2i. Two 2i. I. I'm not going to get the number 0, but what if I think of this as matrix. the 0 matrix? That's what it means. Let's try that with the problem we just did. This, this is one of my absolute favorite results in linear algebra, because I've seen this at the highest levels and how it can be used. This is, like, this is way beyond us. But if you keep going, you get to see cool things. All right, a is 4, negative 5. 2, negative 3. So what's a squared? Well, I can't do that in my head. I've got to write them side by side. So 16 minus 10, negative 20 plus 15, 8 minus 6, negative 10 plus 9. All right, do we agree? Does that look right? Again, I don't, no mistakes here. Negative 20 plus 50, that's be negative 5. Okay. 8 minus 6. Now I think it's correct. I'm waiting for anybody? Confirmation? <laughs> Thumbs up? <laughs> Gladiator pen, any sideways? Matthew, I know, is still holding out. Uh, right? yeah. Commodus? I'm going to keep it there. Keep it sideways? Yeah. I got a square A. This is why I'm doing this for a 2 by 2. If I did this for a 3 by 3, what am I doing to start the problem? I'm cubing a 3 by 3 matrix. I don't want to do that. No, gosh. We'll still be working on that tomorrow. No, I'm, I'm demonstrating this. I'm not proving this. The proof is a little beyond us. We don't need the proof to see the demonstration. So I'm saying A squared minus 2 times... Oh, minus, sorry, minus 1 times A minus 2 times the identity matrix. That's what I want to do. So I have this matrix here. 
minus a, which was 4, negative 5, 2, negative 3, minus 2 times the identity. All right, let's do this. So I have 6 and negative 4 and negative 2, that's 0. I have negative 5 minus negative 5, that's 0, okay. I have 2 minus 2, so okay. I have negative 1 minus negative 3, that's positive 3 minus 3. Oh my goodness. You gotta admit, that's kind of cool. The characteristic equation we developed to find the eigenvalue, if I put the matrix into that, it will satisfy. It. If nothing else, that's just that's kind of cool. Okay, that's the only time we're gonna do this. This is not the theme of this course. This is higher level stuff to solve scarier problems. Okay? Our goal now is how do you find eigenvectors, eigenvalues and eigenvectors just in general? Not their uses. That's gonna come over the next few days. Just how do you find them? Because I just did it for a two by two. That seems relatively simple. But what if it's a bigger matrix? It's always a bigger matrix. <laughs> Let's do, um, let me do one that doesn't have as friendly M numbers in as friendly a place. Let's do A equals 2, 3, 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops, sorry. Ah, my eyes diverted. I changed. No one's ever done this before, right? Start on one problem and accidentally copy a line from a different problem. No one's ever done that mistake, right? <laughs> or is that maybe the most common mistake we do because the problems are so close together? I just did that. I started on one matrix and ended up with another. Okay, make sure I wrote it down correctly. If I wrote it down incorrectly, I can still do the problem. But my eigenvalues may be very unfriendly. We want to stay away from irrational eigenvalues for right now. Because when you have irrational eigenvalues, finding the eigenvectors can be a little bit nastier. So when would we ever deal with irrational eigenvalues? Well, at the same time we introduce complex. Yeah, we're going to do complex irrational eigenvalue, eigenvectors and stuff. That's later. <laughs> that sounds terrifying. We'll be ready when we get there in a couple of weeks. So I, I, want to avoid, I want to avoid the nasty algebra because we won't be able to understand the big picture if we can't get past the arithmetic stages. Do you understand? So we work with safe, friendly numbers because it still takes work to find those. So the very first thing I'm going to do in this problem is set it up. I'm going to do this as my very first step. So determinant of negative 2 minus lambda, 2, negative 1. 2, 1 minus lambda, negative 2, negative 3, negative 6, 0 minus lambda. Now it's a 3 by 3 determinant that I want to evaluate. The clever amongst you would say, can I do any row or column operations to make my life easier? What do you think? No. Why not? Because you have lambda. Every row or column operation you do to make one simpler makes something else more complicated because you got lambdas. You, that's exactly right. Unfortunately, you got to do it the long way. <laughs> yeah. See, if I say, well, can I, I, let's use that negative one to put things up here, but then I'm putting lambdas up here. I'm not making it easier. I'm actually making it harder when I do that. So we just pick a row or column and expand like we always do. I, I, if there was a way around it, I would show you. Trust me. Okay, you with me? So let's just take the first row. My philosophy on evaluating a determinant, if I don't have zeros, I always use the first row. I'm a creature of habit. And you're, but I had a zero there, but I don't have a zero here. <laughs> now, lambda can be any real number. Technically, lambda can be any complex number. But we are only going to do problems in this chapter that give us real solutions, OK? This was easy. Oh, I need a different, sorry. What if? Okay. What changes? You have two complex solutions now. If I asked you to give me the characteristic equation, and I just, I, I, I'll make it simple on everyone. Everybody here just make up a couple of random two by two matrices. Keep the numbers small, don't, don't get silly. You know, keep them single digit, positives, negatives, keep it simple. 
If I said, everyone here, make up a couple of two by two, a couple of them, so we have like 50 to choose from. First of all, how many of you will have integer eigenvalues? Maybe one, two. Okay, but how many of you will have at least real eigenvalues? Exactly half. Only half. Your characteristic polynomial is going to yield complex roots exactly half the time. Of the infinitely many that exist, half of them will be complex. That's an absolute. How do I know that? Because the b squared minus 4ac under the root is going to be negative exactly half the time. Oh, so that means every problem you look at in this chapter was literally reverse engineered to ensure you've got real numbers. And they actually were integer values. That's not the way it is in real life. That's the way it is when we start so we can learn the process. If I just did one tweak of my original matrix so that this comes out of positive 2, which is really easy to do, by the way. Do you see what's up? I have complex solutions, and all of a sudden, this is beyond difficult for us. So there is no guarantee this is friendly. Well, it was in section 7.1. So there's your guarantee. <laughs> it wouldn't be in this section if it wasn't friendly. Now, when you're doing a problem later on in life, in physics, or somewhere else, no, there, there's no bets that are going to, you know, no, no rules whatsoever. Everything is fair game and everything will happen. But not here. We're going to have friendly. So this is negative 2 minus lambda times it's 2 by 2. I'm going to go really slow because the algebra here is far from trivial. Now, when I start doing this, obviously, that's probably the worst of the bunch, right? So what am I going to get here? I'm going to get negative lambda plus lambda squared minus 12. Here I'm going to get negative 2 times negative 2 lambda minus 6. Here I'm going to get negative 3 times negative 4 plus 1 minus lambda. Does that look right? Everybody okay with that? All right, so now when I distribute, I'm going to get 2 lambda minus 2 lambda squared plus 24 plus lambda squared minus lambda cubed um, where are we? Um, plus 12 lambda. That's okay. This is negative 2 lambda minus 6, right? So this is going to be plus 4 lambda plus 12. This is negative 3 minus lambda. So this will be plus 9 plus 3 lambda. <sighs> Almost there. Should there be a positive 2? Oh, where? And the first row is positive 2, then negative 3. You have both of them negative. You talking about this one? Yeah. Uh, is it plus it's minus? minus? Position makes it negative. I'm evaluating the determinant. Oh. <laughs> plus minus plus. Yeah. Ooh. By the way, if, if I made a mistake, point it out. But yeah, that's one we can ill afford, right? <laughs> plus minus plus. So uh, negative lambda cubed minus is that the only so minus lambda squared two lambda plus twelve plus four that's eighteen plus three so twenty one lambda and then twenty four twelve three six forty five. Does that look right? Tell me if I, if I did that right so far. I want to check something. Else. I think I think I didn't make a mistake. No, actually, I, I hope I didn't make a mistake. I think that's right. Okay, now let's factor that. <laughs> um, okay, rational root theorem. So here's the one good thing: the coefficient on the lamb, highest degree lambda term is always going to be one or negative one, always. Why? Because it's always something minus 1 times lambda. So that's good. So now I just have to look at the 45. So my possible rational roots are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 9, plus or minus 15, plus or minus 45. And now what do we do? We use our synthetic division and rational root theorems to try to get down to one root. Remember that stuff? Oh boy, let's roll up our sleeves and start, because that's how it is taught in every place on planet Earth, except this classroom. You want to see the easy way of doing this? I'm going to show you the easy way. By the way, everything we did was true and correct. And let me point out one thing. What if the constant term was a zero? 
What if? Would that now make it an easy problem? Yeah. And sometimes the constant term will be zero, by the way. Sometimes. It will sometimes be zero. It isn't in this case, which means this probably wasn't the best route. So, okay, I'll you know, just try to start with the plus or minus ones and the plus or minus threes. No. So, how far back should we go? We don't know this far back. Now, this does not work on every problem when you expand by the first row, but it will work on every problem with some row or column expansion. Lambda squared minus lambda minus 12. That's lambda plus 3 times lambda minus 4, is it not? This is negative 2 times lambda plus 3, is it not? This is negative 1 times lambda plus 3, is it not? What do I have in each term? Lambda plus 3. And when I factor it out, I'll be left with a quadratic. Can you always do this? Yes. The row or column you choose to expand by may or may not present this opportunity, but some row or column always will. I always go with the first row, and that's usually the safest. Has everybody noticed that I have three different terms, all of them have a lambda plus 3, which means lambda plus 3 is a common factor. So I can now say this is lambda plus 3 times everything that's left. Now, what's left? I'll take my time. What's left? Negative 2 minus lambda times lambda minus 4. Then what? What would be the next term? Plus 4. That's it. I've already factored out the lambda plus 3. What I have left is a quadratic. Now I need to multiply it out and then factor it. I can't factor it in its current form. It's worthless. So this is negative 2 lambda plus 8 minus lambda squared plus 4 lambda plus 7, or negative lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 15. Well, gosh, if they add it, that's not going to work. Oh, wait a minute. What should I do with that negative? Take it out. Most of you, if you saw a negative lead coefficient, that makes the factoring a little confusing, doesn't it? So factor it out. If I factor out the negative 1, then what I have is negative lambda plus 3 times positive lambda squared minus 2 lambda minus 15. Oh, and that's lambda plus 3 lambda minus 5. Ah. Have we factored our quadratic polynomial, excuse me, our characteristic polynomial completely? No. No? Oh, wait. Well, I think we have. Sorry. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> still working on yesterday's notes, right? Does everyone see it? We factored it completely. The factorization, and, and I have a repeated factor. Huh. I wonder how that's going to play into things. Wink, wink. That's probably important. In fact, it's probably absurdly common that I have repeated eigenvalue. So my characteristic polynomial, when all is said and done, I'm going to go all the way back to here. This is the negative lambda plus 3 quantity squared lambda minus 5. This will equal 0 when? When lambda 1 equals negative 3 and lambda 2 equals 5. But I have a 3 by 3. Shouldn't I get three eigenvalues? Well, I did. I did get three eigenvalues. See, I went out with three women last week. My wife, and the next night I went out with my wife, and the following night I went out with my wife. That's called multiplicity. And that's a really important concept mathematically. When you're solving your quadratic, you have exactly two solutions. But some of them might be repeated, that's fine. That just means it has multiplicity. Let me give you a really simple example. You know that if you have a higher degree polynomial, that determines exactly how many solutions you have. you agree? Everybody, everybody cool with that? So I want you to solve, let's say, x to the fourth. How about, um, keep it simple, plus 
4x cubed plus 6x squared plus 4x plus 1. I want you to solve this. Okay? Well, I, I'm going to get four solutions. You're right. You know what I'm going to get? Because this equals x plus 1 raised to the fourth power. So I get the number 1 four times. I have four solutions. I just have a repeated solution. So we call this multiplicity. Multiplicity is huge. Mathematically speaking, you always have to account for every possible solution. And the number of solutions has to equal the degree of the polynomial. Period. No exception. I have a third degree of polynomial. I have to have three solutions. One of them has multiplicity. So what we usually do is we write it like this. We just say it happens twice. It is going to be absurdly common when you're doing a 3 by 3 that you have a repeated solution. The larger the matrix n by n, the more likely you have repeated solutions, believe it or not. That doesn't make the problem harder. In fact, in some cases, it makes it easier because I have less. When I start solving my eigenvectors, I don't have to do two matrices, not three. <laughs> so there's some good things that happen here. OK, you with me on that? So I have multiplicity here. Okay, We'll probably come back to this problem next day because there's there's so much information we haven't even touched. We won't touch today that we're going to get to next day. And we're not going to talk about P and P inverse today. We're not going to talk about the non-standard matrix today. We're going to do all that stuff next day. Very cool stuff. So let me erase this, because now we're ready to do our eigenvectors. Now, here's the thing. Every square matrix has at least one eigenvalue. Every eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector in its eigenspace. So this is huge. If you have an n by n matrix and you have n distinct eigenvalues, that means different, then you have exactly n eigenvectors and you're happy. The only time you're not happy is if you have too few eigenvectors. And I'm going to do one example of I'm going to do one example today of a problem that's going to fail. Just so you know what a failing problem looks like, and then we'll never come back to it. You know, like solving inconsistent systems, right? There's nothing to do, then we leave it alone. If I don't have enough eigenvectors, there's nothing else I can do. There's no questions I can answer down the road. It's not useful in any way unless I have exactly the same number of eigenvectors as I do the degree. So I need three eigenvectors. How many am I absolutely guaranteed? Two. <laughs> two. Yeah, there's our dilemma, so let's figure it out. We can't force the issue. It is, we're just trying to discover the answer. So let's do the first one. So I want a minus negative 3, so a plus 3i. Now, don't write this. Remember, this is what we're solving. We're solving this. So the easiest way to do it is to augment this matrix with zeros. So I don't even bother writing that, but that's absolutely what we're solving. We're finding the null space of the matrix a plus 3i. That's what we're finding. And once we find the null space, we want the basis for the null space, and so on. So take your original matrix, add 3 to each diagonal entry. So 1, 2, negative 3, 2, 4, negative 6, negative 1, negative 2, 3, and now augment this with zeros. Oh, this is so much work. Wait a minute. Is it? If I take... Negative two row ones and add to row two, I'm going to get that. Huh. What if I take row one and add to row three, I'm going to get... Is that a good thing? Oh, that's a very good thing. Why, why is that a good thing, Zachary? Because we have... Um, how many parameters? So therefore, how many vectors are we going to end up with? Two. That's what we need. Is it because the multiplicity was two? You can, let's, let's back up a different way. If, if I have a single eigenvalue and there's no multiplicity, I, I'm guaranteed an eigenvector, but I won't get more. If I have an eigenvalue with multiplicity, I'm guaranteed an eigenvector, but I can get as many as the multiplicity is. So if for some reason you had an eigenvalue or, um, with multiplicity three, you're going to get one eigenvector, you might get two, you even could get three. How many do you need? You need all three. I need as many as the multiplicity, or there's nothing I can do with this problem. Okay? Our goal today is we're not doing any application. We're just finding the things. So I had multiplicity. An easy way to think about this, I'm guaranteed one, but I might get two. I now know I'm going to get two because I'm going to have two parameters when I solve this. 
Does that help? And it's because of the multiplicity, like you said. This guy here is going to have one. It's not possible for this to have multiplicity, but, uh, excuse me, a second eigenvector because this doesn't have multiplicity. Another way of thinking about it is if I have n distinct eigenvalues and each of them has an eigenvector, the moment I have an extra one, I have too many eigenvectors. I can't have more eigen, because the eigenvectors themselves can form a basis for the whole vector space. See, the two eigenvectors that I came up with earlier, wouldn't they form a basis for R2? So the three eigenvectors I'm about to come up with could form a basis for R3. That's why I could not have additional eigenvectors, because there's too many. They can't be a basis. Okay, so how do I parameterize this? I'd say, let, how about x2 equal s and x3 equal t, then what's x1? Yeah, you all agree it looks something like that? So now I can say any vector of the form, there's an order of things. You don't want to jump the gun because if you jump the gun, you may make an error. And the problem with jumping a gun means you're skipping steps and trying to fast forward. But when there's an error, you can't discover the error because you skipped the steps. <laughs> In other words, the, where you made the error were the steps you skipped, therefore you, you have nothing to fix. So you kind of have to go way back. So any vector of this form, so now what do I want to do? Hey, this feels familiar. I want to pull it apart. That's why we learned that technique, because now you're using it. You learned the technique, and it was really efficient and really convenient, but I didn't really. Did I ever have to pull apart the vectors to answer questions before? No, but we did because it just it looked cool. But now we need to because now it's the whole point of that was to find a basis for the null space. The basis for the null space are the eigenvectors. So s times negative 2, 1, 0 plus t times 3, 0, 1. So I will choose, and here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to make, label them. I will choose vector x1 to be the first one, and x2 to be the second one. Do you think the order matters? No. no. Um, could I, have gone, could I have called that T and that S? Most of us would put this in alphabetical order, but then that would have switched the order of these based on my parameterization. So no, there's no, the order doesn't matter. But once you establish an order, you ride that the rest of the way. We are gonna do things like finding Gram-Schmidt or normalization process to eigenvectors. We're gonna do stuff like that. We're going to find P and P inverses based on the vectors. So the order they're written does change the matrix, doesn't it? So if I said put the matrix in a column and then you change the order of the columns, that would change the results of the matrix. If the multiplicity is equal to n, does it mean we're guaranteed? I'm sorry. So if, if the multiplicity of one of the zero is equal to n, are we guaranteed to fail because we can't? You're, you're only guaranteed one eigenvector. We're going to do an example like that. We're only guaranteed one eigenvector. So if I have multiplicity, I could have as many as the multiplicity, but I also might not. If it's equal to the number of rows. If it's like the multiplicity was three for one of these. Right. For the three by three. That means, you're, that means you have one eigenvalue repeated three times, but you're not guaranteed three eigenvectors. You can get as many as three, but you might not. I'm going to do an example where it doesn't work. Just to show you, it feels like it's automatic, and every problem you do, it will work. But in real life, when you get to a differential equations class, they throw a significant number of problems out there where you need eigenvalues and eigenvectors to solve. They can't be solved. And what makes me really upset is then they show you how to solve it. But the solution is completely invalid because they're using answers that aren't actually there. It's like, it's like they're making it up to fill in the blanks. It was a bad question. You shouldn't ask somebody to solve a problem that can't be answered and then show them how to solve it incorrectly. <laughs> and students will come back to me and say, I did this and it didn't work yet. I found an answer in the back of the book. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and if you check it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was somebody's incorrect interpretation of what we're doing now, not understanding that if you don't have enough eigenvectors, you can't answer any questions involving it. Because there, you know, there's going to be no P, no P inverse. There's going to be no non-standard matrix that you're going to be able to work with and all that kind of stuff. Because your original matrix and the non-standard won't be similar matrices. If you don't have enough eigenvectors, then you don't have a basis for a vector space, which means you can't do anything else. You have to have enough to have a basis. I'll just, I'll leave it like that. Next day, I'll, I'll fill in all those blanks. Um, I love it that you guys have questions. Because you're saying, you're asking all the right ones, what if. 
All the what-ifs I think I'll get through next day, but if I don't, ask, okay? I think I did it right. What should I do next? Check. Where should I check? I'm really lazy. I actually leave myself just enough of a gap right here that I can fit my vector. I will never ask to see this check as long as you live. And I will absolutely assume you always do the check because not doing it, oh my goodness. For those in Calc 3, you found the cross product. Okay, I said, do a dot product and check the dot. It literally takes four seconds. But if you don't check, you're saying, I hope I'm right when you might not be. I don't know that I'm right. I, 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 there's a really high probability I'm right. But it might not be. I make errors. So, four plus two is six. Negative four plus one is negative three. Two minus two is zero. Hmm, that doesn't look like this, but if I factor out a negative three, it looks like this. And what was my eigenvalue? Negative three. Did I write it as a multiple of my eigenvector? Yes, I did. Okay, well, tiger woods. Okay, that's the check. That's how long they take. It never takes longer than that. But we all know we could have messed up a negative sign. That's easy. If one of them works, if, if, if uh, x, yeah, so you just checked x1, does that mean that x2 works? I still might have lost it or gained a negative sign. When I'm, by the way, just look at that one right there. Because you're moving things over, would it have been easy to screw up one of those signs? One of the vectors would have worked and the other one wouldn't. So yeah, I still want to check both because there's, there is a real possibility of an error just from writing it down that way. There's, there's just so many things, trivial things. All of us have made the mistakes a million times, right? Copying the wrong number from another problem kind of stuff. I mean, every error that can be made, you see me make. I mean, I, you know, I'm not immune. I never assume it's right. I assume that I probably did it right, but now I'm going to check to make sure I didn't lose something like signs. Negative 6, negative 3, 6, minus 6, negative 3, hmm. And usually I like to do the. All right, I'm two thirds of the way home. Now I need to find my other eigenvector. How do I do that? I do this process again with the other eigenvalue. My other eigenvalue was a five. So I want to do a minus five times the identity matrix and then augment that with zeros. So subtract five from every diagonal entry. And what will this be? Madam, uh, a, it was minus, yeah. So I have negative 7, 2, negative 3. I have 2, negative 4, negative 6. I have negative 1, negative 2, negative 5. Oh, and 0, sorry. And of course, I love that pivot of negative 7, don't you? There's several things I can do. I can say, take four of these and add it to this. I can say, take negative eight of these and add it to this, or probably just maybe do a row switch. Yeah, let's do a row switch. Less likely to mess it up. I'm going to put that one on top. Some of you are looking at the middle and say, why don't I just multiply that by negative a half and then do a row switch? That takes two steps. <laughs> I can do this in one. So. This is more efficient. Now, let's go down. All right, so two of those, two of these would be negative eight. Two of these as negative 10 plus this as negative 16. Negative seven of these, negative seven of these as be a 16. Negative seven of these as be a 32. Are the last two rows multiples? Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. So I'll go ahead and put the zeros on the last row and continue. No. You know you're going to have to parameterize. That's where you need to put zeros above and below. If I don't do that, I create way more algebra and far greater risk of making an error. So I want a 1 here. So I'm going to multiply that row by negative 1. In fact, just for the heck of it, 
I'll go ahead and multiply the top by negative one. I don't need to, but I'll do that. Just makes it prettier. Negative one eighth. I'm not gonna do anything with this one because it's going away anyway. Now, negative 16 of these, negative two of these. One, zero, one, zero. That's why you want the zero above and below. Now there's no algebra to perform on my parameterization. This is a good thing, right? I'm gonna get exactly one parameter. What if, what if, this is going to happen to everybody in the room at some point. You got to this point. How do you solve it? Is an x3 zero? Then an x2 zero, the next one is zero, so the zero vector is the only solution. Oh, that was on the exam. <laughs> we did that on the exam. So here's the thing. This is an absolute money back guarantee. The eigenvalues are the only numbers that when you do a minus lambda i will give you a non-trivial solution to the homogeneous equation. a minus lambda i, those lambdas are the only values that will make your null space non-trivial. If you took any real number on planet Earth and did a minus lambda i and then augmented it with zeros and solved, for every real number other than those, you will get the zero vector as the only solution, as an absolute guarantee all the time. If you have an incorrect eigenvalue, you absolutely have to get the zero vector as the only solution. You will never get a row of zeros because nothing's gonna cancel. You can't parameterize it because you solved the wrong problem, in other words. So the, w never ignore that. When, when this is not working, you go, wait a minute, I'm getting the zero vector. Go backwards and figure it out. It may be that you have the wrong eigenvalue, like the sign got switched. That will happen to everybody. You'll switch the signs inadvertently. At the beginning of this problem, what if I did three and negative five? It would not have worked. If it, if it helps you go back and make this a minus three and try to do this problem, you'll get the zero vector as the only solution. That's an absolute, okay? So you have to have the right eigenvalue. Do you know where this becomes an absolutely astronomical problem? Is when you have irrational eigenvalues. I have a problem that's really large and I needed a computer but the computer's not gonna give me the roots, it's gonna give me decimal approximations. Rounded off decimal approximations. You know what happens if you use a rounded off decimal to find an eigenvector? You'll always get the zero vector for every problem that exists. It means it's absolutely an impossibility to use a rounded off decimal and find eigenvectors. That cannot be done. You have to have exact values or you never get a row of zeros. So what a lot of folks do is they'll round it off and put a lot of decimals. Then when they get numbers, I didn't get all zeros, but I got, you know, 10 to the negative 23rd in this place. Do you suppose that maybe it was supposed to be a zero and it's only a number because of my rounding? Do you see what I'm getting at? When you get infinitesimally small numbers in a position and you use rounded off numbers, it's probably a safe bet that that was supposed to be a zero. You can't get a zero if you round it off. If you're using any value other than the eigenvalue, you can't solve the problem. That's one of the great dilemmas of, like I said, of irrational eigenvalues, especially if you needed technology to find them and you have decimal approximations. Where would that show up? Every physics problem that this comes up in. <laughs> You're not gonna get integer solutions. You're gonna get yucky stuff, okay? Now, I, I have fun with this. How many have seen the last of the Avengers movies, the um, Endgame? Yeah, I, when that came out, I was, we were doing this, literally when it came out, and I, I constantly refer to that movie as Eigengame. It's not Endgame, it's Eigengame. Now, think back for a moment. When Tony Stark was able to figure out time travel, how did he find it? Eigenvalue of the movie. He used eigenvalues of something. By the way, the best part about that is the science doesn't make any sense. A Mobius strip is a non-Euclidean three-dimensional object. Objects don't have eigenvalues. Matrices have. Now, there's, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. An eigenvalue applied to a three-dimensional object doesn't have any meaning whatsoever. <laughs> They'll be like saying, well, what if it were blue? <laughs> but it just sounded so cool that he found the eigenvalue of the inverted Mobius strip. By the way, an inverted Mobius strip is still the same Mobius strip, by the way. Just anybody who knows how to construct one. So whoever came up with this, it, just, it was just such cool language. Right? Those who've been in my Calc 3, how many had Calc 3 with me? Remember when we did when we invented the time machine, right? The DeLorean, 
How did we do that? Remember? We found the flux capacitor. By the way, those in Calc 3, it's, you're a couple weeks away from... Yeah, we're going to calculate flux for the flux capacitor. And by the way, uh, those who are in physics, do flux and capacitors go into the same universe? No, those two are not used together in any context. But it sounds so cool, the flux capacitor, right? The eigenvalue of an inverted Mobius strip. So the entire point of that movie was based on what we're doing today. Tony Stark was in my class a long time ago, just so you know. You know, I, shot him, I told him how to do eigenvalues and stuff. I wish he had you know, included me in some of the revenues from the movies. So we're at this point of the problem. This is fairly trivial. Okay, so what are you going to choose? You're going to say let x3 equal t, then x2 is what? Negative 2t, and then x1 is negative t. Now, I'm going to have two negatives. Some of you may say, you know what, I only want to have one negative, so maybe I'll make that guy be negative. All of that is correct. There is no wrong choice if you're parameterizing correctly. I just go with whatever comes first. So, I'm going to say anything of the form, I'll just say, yeah, because I want to say flat. Anything of the form, negative t, negative 2t, t, or t times negative 1, negative 2, 1, anything of that form will work. So I will choose as my third eigenvector, negative 1, negative 2, 1. I'm pretty sure I did it right. And we'll check. We're not done with the problem, by the way. There, there's more. You know, we're, we're probably around the halfway point. A lot of times in a calculus class, this always makes me laugh. You, know, you did the integral, you got the answer, I'm done. No, you probably did the first 10% of the actual problem that that is involved in, right? There's probably a physics problem. When we do the math and we get an answer, a lot of times in our brain, we're done with the problem. No, we're done with the calculation. The calculation was just a piece of a much larger problem. You with me? So we just found the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We found probably the most important piece of a much larger problem. There's a lot more to do there. We have matrices we still have to find. There's a P, there's a P inverse. We have a non-standard matrix we still need to find. There may be some equations we need to solve that all of these will be employed in the solving of those problems. This is critical because I can't do any of the rest of the stuff without this. But this is the start of the problem. It's the most work, probably, but it's certainly not the end of the problem. Negative 1, negative 2, 1. <coughs> so 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Minus 3, that's negative. Hold on. I do that right. 2 minus 4 minus 3. That's negative 5. Mm -hmm. Negative 2 minus 6 is negative 4. Minus 6, that's negative 10. Positive 1 plus 4, that's 5. Oh, sorry, I put it in the wrong place. Let me do this again. Oops. Is that a multiple of this guy? Well, yeah, it's 5 times it, and that was our eigenvalue. So, <coughs> double check. Every eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector. If you have an eigenvalue with multiplicity, it may have as many as that. It's not a guarantee. Okay? Let me do a simple example. Let me see if I can find one. I think you'll have to throw those in there. If not, I, I can just make one up. It's not that hard, actually. Um, sorry, I thought there was one right in front. Oh, I know it. It's, it's probably in the next section. Yep, yeah, this is the one I was thinking of. Okay. Everybody good with this? Where is this? Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this. He okay, set it up for me. That zero makes it really simple to work with. One more thing after this. 
that it's not technically in this section, I think it's in, I think it's in the next section, but we can understand it today. A very, very powerful property of eigenvalues that a lot of people don't realize that another safety net, another way of checking myself, another thing about the equivalent conditions that just involve eigenvalues that can make things easier. So let's do this first. A minus lambda i would be 2 minus lambda 3, 0, 2 minus lambda. Well, that's pretty easy, isn't it? What is this? Yeah. Oh. So a lambda equals 2 with multiplicity 2. Piece of cake. All right. So now let's do a minus 2i augmented with zeros. Please do this the way I'm showing you. Don't come up with an alternate version. Every, every semester I'll have people... They come up with alternate versions because they went to the internet and read some really horrific explanation that's actually usually not true. More often than not, not even related, but they're like, oh, you know, I, I found this cool thing on the internet that produced different answers and never quite understand why we'd go somewhere else. <laughs> Don't go somewhere else. I'm showing you the easiest way to do it. So, subtracting two from the main diagonal. Is that right? Wow, uh, um, I think I can handle this. Problem. What's the problem? No, 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 no. I don't have any number in the first column. So what's x? Yes, anything. X can be any real number, and it wouldn't affect it, would it? That's what um, you may have heard this term before. This this doesn't happen very often. When I have a column of zeros, not because, by the way, you can't, why have you never gotten a column of zeros when you're doing matrix stuff? Because you can't eliminate the pivot while you're using the pivot. That's the biggest error that exists. Some people will accidentally do that. They'll use the pivot and change the pivot at the same time. If you could do that, then you'd always get columns of zeros and then you'd lose everything. But I didn't do anything except a minus 2i and I got a column of zeros. That means that the first variable is called a free variable. That's the term that we use mathematically. It can represent any real number without any issues. So there's my parameterization right there. Is that okay? That, that sounds weird, and we'll check it to make sure it works, by the way. So I'm going to say let x1 equal t, but then what is automatically x2 equal to? Zero. Because this says 3 times x2 is zero. But we, so any vector of the form t0, which is t times 1, 0, I have an eigenvector of 1, 0. And by the way, we are going to check it right now. I'm not going to tell you it works. I'm going to show you it works. Okay? So when I multiply this, I get 2 and then 0, which is 2 times 1, 0. So, Mr. Brown, you said you were showing us a problem that doesn't work. Well, we're done. Do you see a problem? I have an eigenvalue of multiplicity two. How many eigenvectors do I have? One. Which means this is as dead end as it gets. There's absolutely no question that I could ever answer with this matrix. Because even though I have an eigenvalue with multiplicity, I only got one eigenvector. It can happen. That's, I'm showing you it can happen. It's not going to happen very often. And in the questions we're dealing with, we'll avoid that one because we, we're going to deal with questions that we can answer because that's the whole point of this course is to answer questions. Like I, I, I ask every now and then, how many uh, inconsistent systems have we worked on in this class? The next one will be how many now? The next inconsistent system we solve will be the first one? Yeah. I've taught linear algebra for a million years. I, I don't never done an inconsistent system in the class. There's no point. You can't learn anything from that because there's no algebra you can form. It's a, it's a dead end before you start the problem. We need to know what they look like, but they're never going to come up in reality in this context because it means the question had no answer to begin with. So we avoid that one. This one is just evil. Okay, we don't like this one. Okay. Now, what would be the ultimate silly matrix to try to consider? What do you think? Yeah, let's do the zero matrix. I'll do two by two. No, I'm going to do a three by three zero matrix. All right, so A is.
Every matrix has at least one eigenvalue, and every eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector. I am guaranteeing you there is a non-trivial eigenvector. You know, where? Okay. You will be surprised. All right. What does this look like? By the way, this is probably the easiest determinant you will ever evaluate. <laughs> Do you agree? This was kind of easy. So that would be the negative of lambda cubed, and that equals zero means lambda equals zero. zero but the multiplicity. So the zero matrix has the eigenvalue of zero with multiplicity. By the way, the identity matrix has one eigenvalue, one, with multiplicity. It's not really hard that way, right? because you're gonna go one minus lambda n times. Does everyone see that kind of, that's kind of an easy one, it looks like this one. So how the heck am I supposed to get my eigenvectors? All right, well, let's do it. Let's do a minus zero times the identity matrix augmented with zeros. Whew. Okay, this is gonna be tricky. That means I'm gonna have a matrix that looks like this. <laughs> now I'd like you to solve this. How many free variables do I have? Three. Three. So let's let x1 be r, let's let x2 be s, and let's let x3 be t. That means any vector of the form r, s, t, or r times 1, 0, 0, plus s times 0, 1, 0, plus t times 0, 0, 1 will work. So let's select our eigenvectors this way. x1 will be 1, 0, 0. x2 will be 0, 1, 0. And x3 will be 0, 0, 1. We got three distinct eigenvectors, didn't we? Didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> the zero matrix an n by n zero matrix has n distinct eigenvectors because I have one eigenvalue repeated, but I get this. In fact, even better yet, it's the standard basis, isn't it? Now I'm gonna tell you this because we don't have time. If we did this exact same thing for the identity matrix, I have a matrix of ones. So it's one minus lambda, so it's one minus lambda to the nth power. So lambda equal one is repeated n times, but then when I do a minus one times identity, I'm going to get this matrix again, aren't I? Does everyone see that? And I'm gonna get the same basis. I'm gonna get the standard basis as my eigenvectors. So strangely enough, the zero matrix and the identity matrix have the same eigenvectors. Whoa. That, you gotta that's kind of crazy. Kind of, kind of almost out of control, but you know, go and swim in 10 minutes after a big lunch. I mean, that's just you know, throwing caution to the wind there. But things are not predictable right now, but we're going to see things occurring, and you're gonna start being able to say, you know, what about this? What if I do this one? And some of the results we get will be truly amazing. Now, I'm gonna mention a problem that we're going to look at in a week. We're not gonna do the problem, it's too big. But I've mentioned this before. When I, was, uh, when I went back to school a few years ago to study statistics, one of the professors, Dr. Lin, he was an Olympics junkie, so he was always giving us Olympic data and we do stuff. It was, it, the class was um, linear regression analysis, and that's where you lie down on the couch and talk about your past lives. And... Oh, no, no, that's a different, I don't mind. Regression analysis, your <laughs> linear regression with multiple variables. His favorite problem was to use Olympics, where all the countries were competing. So you had 150 by 150 matrices. That's 22,500 entries in your matrix. But the matrix looked more like a multiplication table. Remember those? Zero to nine, zero to nine. And you multiplied, you guys remember doing that as kids? You filled that? And the matrix, it had symmetry, didn't it? Right, because four times six and six times four were the same thing. Well, a country against another country, that was either a one or a zero, you know, whoever won, depending on. So we dealt with these gigantic things. And we were doing stuff, I'll just leave it loosely, we're doing stuff, but the stuff we were doing wasn't all that hard because there was something special about the symmetric matrix. That's 7.3's lecture. That's considered the most special, important type of matrix. Finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors actually become much simpler. So dealing with an astronomically large matrix actually 
was a lot less complicated than you think because of properties of the symmetric matrix. So there's a lot of stuff we're going to see that is just really, really cool to do. Any questions before we go? Yeah, sir. What does Eigen actually mean? It's German. Um, I, I looked, I, I'm trying to remember. It's, uh, you guys can Google, Google it really quickly. It's, it actually says it in the book. I, I used to know this, but I, to be quite honest, I forgot. <laughs> It's, it's Eigen word, which means proper value. That's what the German is. Sure. I, I just, it's like the first sentence on I used to know that off the top of my head, but I, I had to remember a phone number, so I had to delete that. <laughs> All right, guys.